Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you might be around the world. Thank you for taking your time today to join us for our Scrum Pulse webinar, A Cycle Time Journey, 164 to day 86 days in 69 or nine months. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Adrian Galarza and uh, Ravi Verma, who are going to take you through the session. Uh, my name is Eric Nayberg. I'll be your host and uh, taking your questions and bringing them to our presenters. Next slide, Ravi. Thank you. So uh, your microphones will be muted, but you can ask your questions in the question panel. You should see that in your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, just click questions, send them in, send them away, and we'll take them as we can. Next slide. And just a brief who is scrum.org. Scrum.org is founded by Ken Schwaber. Ken Schwaber is the, uh, our, continues to be our chairman, is a co creator of Scrum. If you uh, watched the video recently of the new release of the Scrum Guide, you got to meet Ken briefly and, and, and see him talk about uh, some of the changes that were recently introduced. Scrum.org's focused in, in, in a mission based organization uh, and focused on helping people and teams to solve complex problems. And we do that through thought leadership, things like this webinar that, that you're watching today. Uh, training. Uh, Robbie is one of our professional Scrum trainers, one of uh, 340 around the world, teaching the same content, same material, and, and really bringing their expertise and knowledge to you um, a, a, to help you improve. Um, certification to validate your knowledge and an ongoing learning through learning paths and the like. Next slide. So with that, I will let Adrian introduce himself, let Ravi introduce himself, and uh, they can take it from there. Guys, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Galarza. I'm a Scrum Master. I've been working uh, with the same organization for almost three years now and uh, first as a consultant and then as an employee. And I'm very passionate about process improvement, benchmarking, operational efficiency, and just overall improvement in our teams. Uh, in the past, I've worked with Amazon and operations roles not related to software, uh, spent a few years in the military, so kind of a varied background. And I think that's really helped a lot with uh, putting together different tools in the toolbox to help my team as a scrum master all right thank you adrian a um, little bit about myself i'm a scrum.org professional scrum trainer one of the best things that happened in my life was ken schweber and the scrum.org community invited me to be part of the family um, and um, the other thing i'm really proud of is uh, with the scrum.org community we created the software code of ethics. Uh, we created this, uh, co-created this Scrum Pulse webinar series many years ago. And with Eric uh, and Sabrina, we created the Scrum Toppers videos. So I think these are some of the things I'm proudest of. And all of them are related to being part of the Scrum.org family. Um, let's talk about what's going to happen. Uh, we want to talk about what is the intent of this webinar, some risks, risk management, We'll talk about the approach that we used for Adrian's team and Adrian's company. What are some outcomes, business outcomes we created for our stakeholders? What hard-earned wisdom we got from this journey? And what can you take away? What, what is it that we would like you to take away from this journey and this webinar? And then some references and the slides will be recording and the slides will be available for you offline, okay? Start with the intent, begin with the end in mind. Our goal, what Adrian and I want, is that you get at least one actionable insight and you take it, you run with it, you do conduct an experiment, and you come back with validated learning in pursuit of reducing cycle time. All right, so 30 days or less, take this webinar, uh, your time is precious, go do something with it, okay, and come back with learning. As, as Ken would say, Scrum cannot fail. Scrum cannot fail, and an experiment cannot fail. It will bring back validated learning. You will know more about the universe than you did before you began the experiment. So that's our hope. What cycle time? Everybody and their brother has a different interpretation. Adrian and I are choosing to interpret in the context of this webinar, we define cycle time as the number of calendar days it took us 
it took a scrum team to take a sprint ready item which had been refined from active from the from the moment that item uh, changed state to active to the moment it was deployed in production and not and when i say deployed i'm not saying deployed dark i'm saying deployed and usable by the target users right so that's how we define cycle time right why does it matter uh, we, the only intent of reducing your cycle time is to reduce the number of calendar days it takes for you to come back with validated learnings from the market and then adjust future investment. So Gunther says there is one and only one source of truth and that is the market. And Kurt Bittner from Scrum.org says every PBI is a, is a suspect until proven otherwise by the market. So if we come from a stance of humility, what Scrum is telling us is every PBI is a hypothesis, at best is an educated guess. And don't fall in love with the guess, but fall in love with the wisdom that will come when you deliver that guess to the market and you observe how the market responds so that you can be better stewards of your precious time and money in terms of future investment, okay? So that's why cycle time is important. And I love this quote, and I thought it was from Darwin, but one of the scrum.org PSTs, Ram, told me, no, Ravi, it's not from Darwin. So it's from someone else, maybe inspired by Darwin, because especially as COVID has taught us, it's not about um, you know, the strongest being the strongest, but it's about people or species or organizations that can adjust to the world, which can undergo tectonic and unpredictable shifts that nobody can anticipate. One year ago, maybe in October, November, many of our clients, October or November of the year, they start doing strategic planning. All the execs go offline and they go to a strategic retreat, a fancy hotel, and they come back and they create the portfolio plan and investment. Imagine in October of 2019, all the executives who did their strategic planning and the backlog that they created, if we had executed that backlog in 2020, in the face of COVID, it would have been a colossal waste of time and money because in October, nobody even knew what COVID was. So the point is not that you've got to be the strongest company. The point is not you've got to be the fastest company. You've got to understand when your plans have been rendered useless in the face of a changing world and you've got to adapt and adjust faster than your competition. And that's why cycle time is important, right? Let's talk about the risks of this webinar. You may be tempted to robotically copy paste whatever Adrian shares in this webinar to your context. And that can cause needless suffering in the name of agility and scrum. And it would be unethical for Adrian and I to set that expectation because our first responsibility is to do no harm. Right? So Ken Schwaber tells us, do the right thing and the results will follow. The results don't follow, at least you did the right thing. So our highest responsibility to you is to do the right thing and to do no harm. So this is a word of caution. Please do not robotically copy paste a technique and into your organization and think that it is going to reduce your cycle time from 164 days to six days. When we published this webinar, it was eight days. I recently attended Adrian's sprint review. I think it had gone down to six. Okay, so what can you do instead? Listen for our intent in our context. What intent did we want to achieve for our stakeholders? Understand the context that we were in. Most importantly, look beneath the surface. So Gunther tells us the scrum guide is like an iceberg. 10% is above the surface. 90% is below the surface. 10% is stated in the letter, 90% is implied in the spirit. So what I would love for uh, you to do in, as you listen to Adrian is to look beneath the surface, the meta, the meta process, the mindset. And then once you understand our intent, now replace it with your intent. When you once you understand our context, replace with your context. Take what was beneath the surface 
and now adjust the practices to your context while staying true to numbers one, two, and three. All right, that's my ask. Okay, so let's talk about the approach. There are two parts of this conversation. One is what happened before and around Adrian's team, and it was almost like a community garden. So, you know, one of our Scrum.org colleagues is, uh, is Kelly, and uh, Kelly is actually involved in a community garden, and what's happening inside Adrian's company is kind of like a community garden. So uh, we came in and we tried to build a community garden, and one of the Scrum teams is like, a patch inside of the community garden, and that is Adrian's team. But that team cannot exist in isolation. It is part of an ecosystem. It's part of a complex adaptive system. And Adrian's team is impacting other teams, and the other teams are impacting Adrian's team. So you cannot fully appreciate what Adrian was able to do or his team was able to do without appreciating what was going on around them and what happened before the team was bo uh, was born. All right, so. I'm going to spend some time telling you what happened before and around Adrian's team. Then I'm going to pass the ball to Adrian. And Adrian is going to tell you what happened within his team. So that's the structure of the webinar. All right. So let's zoom into what happened before and around. So this was a four-year journey. Uh, we began in 2017, May, I think. And we are going to zoom in probably to six months between uh, Feb and September, and actually this was when the webinar was published and it's now December, so probably a six to nine months journey. So just to let you know, it was not an easy, it was not an easy uh, step where I flipped on, we flipped on a switch and magically in six months, it cycle time reduced. A lot of groundwork happened before, all right? This is just to give you a sense of what happened. The fundamentals were, we have an ethical company, ethical leadership, Ken Schwaber talks a lot about professionalism and what it means to be an ethical software practitioner. The company's culture and leadership stay true to agile principles, scrum values, and the principles and practices of, of uh, Nexus and evidence-based management. Then we did a bunch of foundational training, PSD, PSF, Rich Bisovsky did PSD, uh, and this is not in chronological sequence, but at different points in time, key influencers, if not the entire team, were exposed to these ideas in the surrounding ecosystem. Mark Nonaman did KSD, Gary Podretti did PSU, Rich Bisovsky did P, uh, 3. Management 3.0, Chuck Suschek did BDD. Um, I attended PSK with Daniel Bacanti, and uh, one of our other Scrum Masters attended the PSK with Yuval. So all of these ideas have been now absorbed in the ecosystem. And as, as Ken says, knowledge must be validated. So a lot of uh, key people have actually taken the scrum.org exams to test their knowledge. Now the exam or uh, earning a badge doesn't mean that you're going to be more effective. It's purely, it's a flawed risk management technique. There is a lower risk of you going and causing damage if you understand the theoretical fundamentals, right? So it's a risk management technique. We created a bunch of playbooks for Scrum events and activities. These were co-created and they evolve based on what's working and what's not working. The single biggest thing that I would say is the agile community of practice. And Adrian is a very uh, involved member. We try to crowdsource the wisdom from the community as opposed to an external coach like me imposing what I think is best. So, and there are a whole bunch, there's a scaffolding in place. We have, there's a scrum of scrums, there's alignment on the business team members, uh, there are lunch and learns, we have monthly paths to agility events, again, inspired by scrum.org terminology, where we appreciate our role models, uh, and we have executive alignment. So there's a lot of scaffolding in place inside of which Adrian's team uh, operates, okay? So where we began, there was a grassroots scrum adoption. There were a couple of teams, uh, especially for Adrian's team, there was no full-time scrum master. There was a person who was so passionate about scrum, she took on two jobs. She had a job uh, as a BA slash technical project manager, but her heart and brain was saying, no, this is the right thing to do. So she took on a second job as a scrum master. And she brought the team as far as she could within her constraints because she's doing two jobs, no formal training, uh, no coaching, uh, and the team was struggling because they went as far as they could, right? 
So what adjustments did we make? We added a dedicated product owner. We added Adrian as a full-time Scrum master. Uh, and we started, one of the first things that Adrian did was to increase focus on backlog refinement. Because if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And in fact, Scrum will help you drive your car into the ditch faster, better, cheaper, right? So that's where Adrian comes in. And now Adrian is going to tell you what happened inside of his team. So I am going to pass the ball to Adrian. So Adrian, please take it away. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, so we uh, categorized a lot of the things that we accomplished in those six months into four different categories. Uh, and then we kind of ranked them in order of importance. Stakeholder collaboration, that was a really big one because uh, as Robbie just said, without that collaboration, without knowing what we're building or where we're going, we can get there faster, but we might end up in the wrong place. And then the next category was Scrum Team Collaboration. So the team was already uh, working fairly well, but we found inefficiencies and areas of improvement, and we uh, put some focus on that area as well. And then third thing was technical excellence. We tried to find enablers that can help us speed up and be more effective and be more efficient. And finally, uh, would be sprint planning. So in sprint planning, we also found some opportunities for improvement. We adjusted and adapted and made it a little bit better. And all of these four categories contributed. So first of all, with stakeholder collaboration, we have a question for the audience. What is the single biggest challenge in this area that increases your cycle time? What prevents you from going to market quicker? If you guys have questions, please post them on the chat and then we'll come back to them. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so in stakeholder collaboration, the challenges that we're fight, uh, facing is that we had a high amount of rework. Our refinement was uh, pretty good, but not quite good enough yet uh, in the beginning we would find that we would uh, identify additional acceptance criteria when we thought we were done with the user story. So we were doing the best that we could with refinement, thought we had it all figured out, show it to our end users, and they're asking, uh, what about this other thing? And we didn't know about it. So then we have to come back and work on it, and usually the next sprint. Another thing that was happening was the testing uh, sometimes we had bottlenecks. We didn't have very good alignment yet with our business unit and our SMEs on what we needed from them. So let's say that we actually developed the right PBI, but we couldn't get it tested. And then the end of the sprint shows uh, and it comes up. And because we can't get it tested, we can't deploy it abroad. So that was uh, another big challenge. So let's see uh, what we did about it. And what we tried is uh, just engaging our business users a lot more. And uh, one of the easier ones was just to invite our relevant SMEs to refinement so we could extract that knowledge that they had in their heads and try to build the right thing the first time. The other thing related to testing is that we kept having conversations in retros and other venues about how we might enable a more seamless flow through the process, including testing, so that we can be done a little bit quicker. And uh, if I can sum up these lessons, is really trying to take a one-team approach, not business, not IT, but together, we need to work together to make this happen. And uh, one thing that I will point out is that I'm really thankful to our business unit leadership because they saw the vision, they saw what we were trying to do, and uh, they were able to allocate the business team members to help us and to uh, be more efficient, to tell us what the right things were. And so this was actually a very big culture change that uh, Ravi helped enable and uh, our Scrum Masters helped enable by having conversations throughout the organization. And it's a culture change of going from an IT driven development where the business kind of flies in once in a while, tells you a little bit about what they want. They fly back out. All right, IT, you work on it. 
and now it's a constant conversation. If you saw our uh, our Teams chats, it's uh, all day long, every day, at any time, everybody's talking together and collaborating. It's a thing of beauty. Adrian, one of the questions that, that came is, what, what kind of experience did the Scrum Masters have or were you looking for that, that made this helpful? Mm -hmm. uh, so the our, our Scrum Masters are actually veterans. We went through a program called Agile for Patriots that uh, uh, Ravi and uh, Scrum.org have contributed to. So we were actually new Scrum Masters in the beginning and uh, learned our way through it. But one thing that contributed to this a lot was being ex-military, many of us have uh, are very used to and learn to adapt on the fly and we know what's important and we focus on doing the right thing. And uh, it's what I like to think of is it's, it's a growth mindset, really. If anybody's heard of growth mindset versus fixed mindset and a growth mindset really tells you that you can get better, you, you're open to learning, you're, uh, you're not, putting yourself within the box that you're limited in a certain way. Whereas a fixed mindset, you some people believe that they have like a certain level of knowledge, a certain level of intelligence, and that doesn't change much, which is uh, counterproductive to adaptability and uh, continuous improvement. So that growth mindset from uh, some of the veterans, I think is a really key. Ravi, do you have anything to share on that? Yeah, I want to add to what you're saying, Adrian. So this program, the total prior Scrum experience for all the Scrum Masters was zero. Uh, and what I, I've been, I don't know, I've probably trained thousands of uh, people in my life in Scrum and Agile. I've interviewed hundreds, if not thousands of people, uh, hundreds of thousands or maybe thousands of Scrum Masters. I've, I've lost track. I feel that uh, the Agile for Patriots program, it had a filter because we only have U.S. military veterans and, and spouses. So they come built in because in the military, you've got to have cross-functional teams and you've got to, you have to ha have a service-oriented mindset. So we, we find purpose-driven people. And then there's a second filter. The people who thrive and succeed the most, as Adrian was saying, they have the growth mindset, and I would also add, maybe it's related, it's the beginner's mind. The beginner's mind is forget what you thought worked. Now you're in the world of Scrum. Come with humility and curiosity. And the people who have thrived the most in this, and which is true for all the Scrum Masters in this organization is that they set aside whatever they thought they knew about software development and they surrender to me and the Scrum Dorog community and say, okay, you tell us. And they tried it. They're always trying. And I think those are the characteristics or criteria about these scrum masters that I think help them create these high performing teams. I completely agree, Ravi. And if I was looking forward in the future, if I was uh, looking to recruit a, a scrum master, I think I would place a lot more emphasis on having the right mindset instead of X number of years of experience because the with the ability to take initiative and the ability to learn that can be taught and they'll be top performing whereas the experience will be great but without the right mindset it might not be the best combination for what, what i would be looking for yeah you can't teach attitude scrum is so simple it's uh, the the scrum guide 2020 has become even simpler uh, it doesn't take long for someone to just get scrum, but if the attitude is misaligned, you, it's very hard to unteach and reteach attitude. Absolutely. Okay, so what happened next? Uh, throughout this process over those six months, uh, we got much better at identifying our acceptance criteria. Uh, we got better at uh, keeping up uh, with our, our, our testers keeping up with development so that we could complete things within, within the same sprint. And we were able to reduce our amount of rework a lot so that we could actually, uh, at first, do one deployment every single sprint to complete our PBIs. And with that collaboration also uh, with the business leaders, what helped is that we started 
you know, communicating a lot and saying what was expected from the testers and the business unit leadership was able to give the ability for those testers to work with us. So they created space for them and time for them to be able to do it. And that was a big game changer for us. Okay, next slide. Eric, are there any questions on that topic before we move on to Scrum Team collaboration? Um, let's see, sorry, it was frozen for a minute. So how did the Scrum Masters engage um, the outside entities to get them to show up and collaborate more? Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, actually a multi-pronged uh, effort. So Scrum Masters would just talk with the uh, business users. A lot of the times that uh, I meant a, uh, calling them up for scheduling a meeting, talking about this is what we're trying to achieve and what would be helpful, a collaboration would be helpful, but it also came from all levels of the organization. We have what we call servant leaders, and that's uh, directors that uh, work in IT. They took a very active role also in communicating with their business peers and as well as the executive leadership. So it was kind of that garden that Ravi was talking about. It wasn't just one solution. And Ravi's coaching was really critical to that. He was working with the executive leadership as well to try to go in the right direction. Awesome. And, Ravi, and Eric, to yeah, I want to add a couple of things. The first is CEO level support. So the CEO was crystal clear uh, that we, we are going to make it work and you're going to have you're, you're going to work together with each other you're going to find a way to work with each other rock solid support from the cto rock solid support from the business executive the c-level executives on the business side i truly believe i've tried bottom-up agile adoption it, it, it stalls beyond a particular point uh, neither bottom-up alone nor top-down alone is uh, is going to work we need both so the fact that whenever uh, people felt uncomfortable with this new way of being, which is what it means to be human. I resist change like hell whenever my wife tries to <laughs> impose change on me. So it's human. It's natural that when you someone externally imposes change, there is resistance. But the fact that the executives shut the back door and said, we're going to make it work. Tell me what you need. How can we support you? That helped. But I would say the single biggest factor was we complemented the Scrum framework by adding a role called the servant leader, which is a director level person whose job is to ruthlessly hunt and destroy impediments that are outside the sphere of control and influence of the Scrum master. So the Scrum master is take, removes as many uh, impediments as they can. And when organizational limitations, uh, lack of formal authority, gets in the way of the scrum master that's where the bread and butter of the servant leader is to remove those impediments and adrian's servant leader the servant leader leader for adrian's team spent so much time uh influencing the hearts and minds of the business community explaining to them what's in it for me uh, how might this help them take care of their customers because we have a very customer centric organization. And if we were able to explain how Scrum is not the end goal, as, as Ken might say, but it is a means to an end. And the end is serving our customers. So she did so much work behind the scenes uh, to bring the community, business community. Eric, other questions? I think we can move on for now and come back to others as, as time allows. Sounds good. Okay, uh, similar thing here. Uh, if there's any questions, you know, or you have any feedback, what is your single biggest challenge in the area of Scrum Team collaboration? If you guys want to go ahead and type it in, and uh, if we have time, we'll come back to it. Okay, next slide, please. So in, uh, in terms of Scrum Team collaboration, for us, one of the challenges that we were finding is that 
coming from a traditional legacy kind of a setup, we had dependencies on external teams for skills that we didn't have within the team. And some of them were things that we didn't deal with very often. Uh, one example was Java for the project that we were working on. We had some some work on Java code, but the majority was other uh, other uh, types. And within the team, we didn't have any uh, Java developers or any Java skills. So what would happen is we would often have to wait for the Java team at the time that was being, uh, they were very popular. So everybody reached out to them. Everybody had requests. They had to prioritize. Sometimes our request was days away or weeks away, and that caused a bottleneck. So we identified that and uh, set out to correct it. And the other challenge that we were facing was that our refinement sessions often were running long. And uh, uh, what was happening is that we would, in the, in, in the effort of trying to accomplish a lot, maybe we were multitasking, but then that created inefficiencies because, you know, when you multitask, you can't multitask at 100% for everything that you're doing. So some of the message or some of the refinement was was lost to some people. And then we noticed the effect later on when we had already covered something in refinement, but the same question would come up the next time we were talking about that item. And uh, so it created a lot of inefficiencies. We would have to go back and talk about it again. We weren't identifying some of the blind spots that could have been identified. So we all recognize that as a problem. And then in the retro, we started to try to correct that. So uh, what we tried next, uh, we started cross-training in the most critical skills that were becoming our impediments. So we had one of our uh, very motivated developers say, he raised his hand, I'm up for the challenge, I'll learn Java. And that way we don't have to rely on those other Java developers that might not be available. And within a couple of months, he was pretty good and he could handle it by himself. And uh, anytime we had that come up, it didn't become an issue. We could take care of it. And uh, it was a similar thing with like CICD pipelines. In the past, that had been the domain of the architect team. But as we started decentralizing that, our developers started to pick up those skills so that we didn't have to wait for the architects to be available. And then in, in terms of the refinement session, uh, when we had a, a conversation in the retro, we explained what was happening. I think everybody was uh, very understanding. They were noticing that, yes, we're not being efficient in this. So one of our develop, dev team members came up with the idea of hey, why don't we hold ourselves accountable? When we do refinement, we should all be focused. Let's turn on our camera. That way we won't be uh, tempted to uh, let our mind wander or start multitasking. And we focus on it and get it done. And the result that we found is that that worked really well. We were able to stay within our time box. We uh, had more questions to help identify potential gaps or potential blind spots that we had. So that the results, if you can click next, please. Okay, so we, we reduced that dependency on the external teams. And now the team is that lofty goal of having a cross-functional self-organizing team for the most part. We don't hardly ever need anything from anyone else. And uh, that made us way more efficient. And on refinement, we just got better at it. We made sure another thing that we that was critical to us is that as, as work emerges, you know, sometimes the acceptance criteria will change or you discover something new. And uh, one thing that we were not necessarily always doing is we would get agreement with the product owner. Hey, we, we propose this other method Let's try it. If the PO agreed, we would try that. But we were uh, not always updating the user story with the acceptance criteria. And that created a little bit of a blocker when our testers went to look at that user story and compare it against the product that was being delivered. 
the acceptance criteria was out of date and they were saying, well, this product doesn't match the acceptance criteria. So we saw that uh, kind of hurting us and we as a team agreed, if I'm working on a user story and something changes, I will make sure that I update it so that it's current and uh, there's no further questions related to that being out of date. Ravi, was there anything you wanted to share in this from your perspective? Yeah, I want to. Absolutely. Thank you, Adrian. There are a couple of things. I want to explain what's happening beneath the surface that enabled this. I want to contrast what happened in this organization with two other organizations I've coached. Uh, let's talk about cost functionality. So there was one organization that I was coaching and I was trying to uh, convince or influence management to say, each person, we can have specialists on a scrum team. There could be someone who has deep knowledge in testing, someone has deep knowledge in coding, but we need to do whatever needs to get done in service of the people we exist to serve. And in the scrum framework, that manifests through the sprint goal. So if that means uh, I, am, I am a ninja in Java development, but I need to do some .NET development, guess what? I wasn't born a Java developer. I learned Java, and if I can learn Java, I can learn .NET. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be as good as someone who's been doing .NET for 10 years, but instead of me optimizing for my comfort zone and picking up Java backlog items from six months down the line, when COVID might hit and it may become waste, it would be better if I'm slower at working uh, on a valuable item using .NET now than being super fast and working on a Java item, which is likely going to get obsolete six months down the line, right? So when I try to educate my previous clients in this mindset, I've had actual clients tell me, Ravi, the hourly rate of a developer is very high. The hourly rate of a tester is low. No way in hell am I going to ask a developer to do testing. If I have that kind of an executive team, there is no hope for cross-functionality, right? So compare and contrast to the leadership team of this organization where the expectation is, guys, all we care about is serving our customers. Do what we need to do to achieve the goal. So there was a loud message coming from, coming from leadership. I had another client where they, we hired developers on the React stack, and then it turned out we made a nexus, and in some sprints, the sprint goal required work on Java, and some developers had a mutiny and went to the CTO and says, said, Java is like career suicide. I'm not going to do Java work. If you force me to do Java work, I'm going to resign. The CTO got scared. The CTO created a boundary or a firewall around those people and said, I don't care what the sprint goal is. These people are only going to do React work. Contrast to this leader, and he didn't do that, right? And the last thing I want to say is uh, the person that Adrian is referring to, his mindset was, I'm going to do whatever it takes to take care of the team and my customer. So in his value system, serving the stakeholder, serving the team is higher than what his resume is going to look like if and when he gets back on the job market. So why am I asking you this? When you are hiring people, there are scenario-based questions that you could use to figure out what is the value system of this person. And you may get a sense for how they may behave. And is it compat under you know, crisis situations and if their values are compatible with Scrum or not. Uh, one last thing, CICD, this organization used to have a separate change control organization, and, a, and CICD used to be handled by the architecture organization. So in many traditional organizations, the mindset is the developer is fundamentally untrustworthy. So you put checks and balances like change control and architecture or DevOps, because if you let the developer run loose, who knows what they will do? The inmates are running the asylum. Contrast with this organization's executive team, their mental model is developers are trustworthy. Our job is to give them the tools that they need and get the heck out of the way and provide coaching and support. And when they did that, 
we no longer had a bottleneck on change control or CI/CD because the executive enabled that autonomy to be inside of the team. So I want to amplify some things which happened around to make this happen. All right. So, so Ravi, tied to the first part of what you just said, um, how did you report progress, or how do you report progress to those leaders? It's so you're saying the leaders are asking all these questions. How are, how are you communicating back? to those leaders on progress, right? They're, they're all used to getting things like Gantt charts or, or whatever. Um, are, are, are there things or, or thoughts that you have to help address that? Yeah, so I was heavily influenced by the evidence-based workshop I attended with Ken in Boston many years ago. And then uh, Patricia Kong and Kurt Bittner have been guiding me ever since. So we used evidence-based indicators as a way to uh, visualize progress. And uh, version one of the dashboard that we created was based on, actually it was a mock-up that I did, and Adrian is a wizard with tools, he's, he, and he also understands the business language because he's got an MBA from Carnegie Mellon. So what Adrian did was, he took my ugly mock-up and he started automating it. So MVP2 was an Excel, which is sucking data from Azure DevOps. MVP3 was Power Builder. And I think now we are version on MVP4, which is a more sophisticated on-demand Power Builder uh, dashboard. Uh, so the executives have these dashboards on their fingertips, plus we have attached these uh, evidence-based agility inspection, and we've attached it to the sprint review. So the CTO and the head of business, the the highest executive in each business area attends, religiously attends every sprint review. So we are trying to provide them the visibility and the transparency that they seek and deserve in a more agile and scrum compatible and a business outcome compatible format by using evidence-based management and by attaching the habit, the micro habit of evidence-based management to a pre-established habit, which is the scrum sprint review. So anyway, that's my perspective. Adrian, what would you like to add or please correct me as needed? No, I think you covered it pretty well, Ravi. Having having them join like a sprint review and sometimes pop into other events as well has been critical to provide that transparency so that they feel comfortable, they know what's going on. The other thing is just the outcome of the improvements that we've made across the board, not just with my team, but with other teams as well. Now that the teams are getting more mature on agile practices, uh, I think across the board, we've become more predictable so that there's less uh, whipsawing around, I think you could say. And they that definitely feels a little bit better combined with EBM, our evidence-based management practices, so that we have a sense of looking at progress and being fairly close to it, not just uh, we're aiming for something, but it might or might not happen. So now that predictability is there. I think that's helped a lot as well. All right, very good. Okay, uh, moving on to technical excellence. I see we have about 16 minutes left. So let's, we'll, we'll try to speed it up a little bit without leaving things out. So the, Things that uh, the challenges that we faced on technical excellence is that we were noticing still a lot of uh, rework bugs, especially in the beginning, about six months ago or more. And uh, we took a multi pronged approach. First of all, like we talked about earlier, by trying to do better refinement, identifying all of our acceptance criteria. And then the testing bottlenecks were also uh, there, not only because of people, but because of. The complexity of the product that we have been working on. If you imagine something, uh, for anybody that does TurboTax, if you remember how there are so many fields to fill out, how there are interactions between the fields, there's a lot of calculations, a lot of validations, that's similar to what we were working on. So to manually test TurboTax would be a big challenge every time you do a new deployment, especially if you want to do regression testing for all of it. So that was something similar to what we were facing. So uh, click next, please. So our biggest enabler in this area 
was to start using automation testing and uh, shifting really a culture shift again from uh, defect detection and then fixing it to how do we prevent defects, make sure that they don't even get to production. The earliest that we can catch them, the better off we are because there's less, wa less waste in that regard. If we catch them in development, it hasn't been deployed to QA, then it hasn't been tested, it hasn't gotten to production, it hasn't impacted a customer. So that's really our goal is to try to catch them as early as possible. And then the second thing was also uh, prioritizing, you know, technical excellence, make sure that we're paying off our, our debt as we go along. Um, learning that those bugs that are still required to be fixed, if you set them aside and try to do them at a later sprint, that doesn't make them go away. So we started just trying to dig through that monster. We had a bit of a backlog, but our, our dev team was up to the challenge. They tried to get those resolved as quickly as possible. And I think it was maybe a little bit painful for a few sprints, but we got it to a much more manageable level. And uh, the thing that I would really encourage, I think that a lot of people don't see the vision in automated testing, but it's been a huge time saver for us. And not just saving time of our testers from doing complicated sessions of regression testing that are hours long, but it's also prevented a lot of risk for the uh, organization because we can run these tests that used to take maybe four hours or more, and now they run in like two and a half minutes. And we've actually uncovered issues that we might not have caught with manual testing, but our, our Selenium automated regression testing was uh, so it, it covered those some of those some of them were edge cases, but it found them where we would maybe not have found them for weeks and it might have had a customer impact. So definitely a big enabler for us. And it went from being seen as, oh, you're asking me to do this extra work, but I'm I have development to do. I have to work on this user story. And then as a team and as a, an organization, I think we started seeing the value of it a lot more and uh, saw it not just as a cost, but as an investment that pays off. And uh, so, yeah, with a result, a lot less manual testing, uh, that helped us be more efficient because we weren't wasting the time of our testers. They could do the regression automated testing and then uh, be able to sign off more quickly, be able to go to prod more quickly. And uh, yeah, it re reduced a lot of that inefficiency of going back and forth to QA and going to back to fix something, back to QA, to test it, wasting time, back to fix it, and so on. So it made this process a lot smoother. Yeah. Probably anything else? Uh, yeah, I want to add uh, this. Uh, I learned this from Mark Norman, who's a Scrum.org PhD. Uh, and he taught me the difference between quality control and quality assurance. Quality control, let's get faster, better, cheaper at detecting and fixing defects. But what Mark taught us was, let's get better at quality assurance, which is preventing defects. And, and you know, Dr. Chuck Suschek taught us about behavior-driven development, specification by example, and then also we started using Selenium. And also, there's a couple of other things happening beneath the surface. I've been in companies where the business organization or product owner will say, I don't care about your tech debt and your defects. You created these defects. You work nights, weekends, or you IT, do what you need to do to fix this. You dug yourself into the ditch. I'm not going to give my feature points for you to clean up the mess you made. Right? That's a very adversarial relationship. This is a real world scenario. And here, in this case, we have a supportive business organization that values technical excellence and says, no, we're going to do the right thing. Without the support from the uh, product owner, this is very hard right? because there's a fight. There's a fight between the tech people and the non-technical uh, non people. The second thing is other teams where we try to introduce the exact same ideas in the exact same company, developers who are not aligned with automation testing, they say, to the executives, okay, you want me to do automation testing, double my schedule. So they bring in the schedule boogeyman to say you can have either quality or you can have time, but you cannot have both. Uh, 
And uh, Adrian's team was, we, whenever we give them a suggestion, if it passes the sniff test, they're like, yeah, let's try it. And they tried it. It uh, reduced manual testing. It improved quality. And they said, okay, they just ran with it, right? So there's a difference. There's some, something magical going on in Adrian's team. Maybe that's a growth mindset. When you give them a new idea, if you explain how it might make sense to the customer, they are usually open to it, especially when empirical evidence is suggesting that the alternative is not working. So these are some things that happen beneath the surface um, that contributed. Um, and executives were not measuring success in terms of the number of velocity points you have developed, but instead, how much value are you providing in delivering the highest quality, highest value solution in production that is usable by stakeholders? Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, sprint planning. If you have a challenge, please type it in and hopefully we can come back to it. And uh, so on, on sprint planning, we were facing an issue that we still, you know, shifting from a waterfall mindset, we initially, I think maybe one of the first transition steps for some of the teams is to make it a mini waterfall. Right now it's a two week waterfall. So let's work on all the things and then we'll get them done maybe one day or maybe two days before the end of the sprint. What that was causing is that our business community and our uh, people that were testing our PBIs, our user stories, all of a sudden had six, seven, eight developers worth of work to test in like one or two days from the whole sprint basically. So that became a, a huge bottleneck for us. And uh, another thing that we realized is that we identified that there were some of our PBIs that were a little bit riskier than others. They were maybe more complex. And uh, it seems like common sense, but hopefully maybe this will help somebody. We identified that some of those risky ones, if we started working on them a little bit later in the sprint, then we would have no time to come back and deal with any problems or issues or questions or blockers that we might be facing. So we made a conscious effort during sprint planning to look through our backlog of the items that we were looking at for the next sprint and say, is there anything here that might cause us problems? Is there anything here that might be risky? And is there anything here that might enable us uh, to be more, uh, improve our flow? And if, if there is any of those categories, then what we do is just raise those to the top. Our team decides uh, who's going to work on what, and we try to resolve those first so that they don't become blockers later. If there is a blocker, we're able to resolve it around the middle of the sprint instead of at the end when we're stressed out trying to finish those. So that was a pretty simple one, but uh, I think that one has helped quite a bit. And so now the outcome of these practices is that now we're doing more frequent, small deployments within the sprint. And this also evened out the flow of the work to our teammates that are testing, whether it's a developer or one of our business team members. And that relieved a lot of the pressure that they felt in the last two days because that was not a, a good time for them when we were doing that in the past. And uh, this also, you know, helped enable, help, help reduce the number of blockers that we had because now we have more time to deal with them. And that's really enabled us to do uh, up to maybe four prod deployments in some sprints. Going back from, you'll see in a minute what the results or what it looked like before and after. Robbie, anything to add? Nope, nope, you covered it. Okay, thanks. So this is just a recap of the things that we tried. Um, please feel free to refer to it in the slides when, if you uh, download them. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Okay, uh, now we'll talk about achievements. Um, in the interest of time, I think we have achieved a, a lot, a lot of better quality, reliability, responsiveness, value, our stakeholders, uh, feel more happy, I uh, think they're more, they're less stressed about the changes and the impact of our business operations as well. And uh, 
a lot of times they're saying, I can't wait to try that in production. And that's really, really uh, good to hear. Yeah, Adrian, if I may add the human benefit, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the team that Adrian or the, the stakeholders that the that Adrian's team helps were actually impacted by a hurricane in 2020. And because the team worked so hard in developing these muscles, I think Adrian's team was able to release a feature within, Adrian, was it two to three days? I don't know how many calendar days it was. I think once we got the go ahead, it was within uh, the same day to the next day. Uh, we got kind of a heads up like three days before, and then it was a very quick turnaround because of that flow that we enabled. In the past, we would have probably had a lot of things in QA that couldn't move because they hadn't been tested. So that would have been a blocker. And now that we have that kind of flow going, it really enables us to respond to important changes really quickly. Yeah. So that's the human impact or the human benefit of a shortened cycle time with Scrum. There were people whose lives were upended by a hurricane and Adrian's team was in a position to make a positive impact. So that's what it means to reduce cycle time, right? So here, what I wanna show real quick is uh, one of those dashboards that Ravi was referring to. So this is not to scale, but if you look on the left side, what this is telling us is uh, we're seeing how many, what our velocity was, how many story points are we delivering to production every sprint? And we went many sprints where there's blank over here on the left side, uh, went many sprints without delivering anything. The orange is new development and the dark brown is bug fixes or defects. And so we were very like unpredictable. Sometimes we could deliver, sometimes we couldn't because of a lot of the uh, blockers that we identified earlier. And so some sprints would be kind of average, like the first tall orange, bar and then we would go several sprints without delivering because we had some kind of blocker and then maybe there's a huge batch uh, deployment and this was this chart ends in like the beginning of February so within the last nine ten months just right before COVID this is what our team looked like and then on the right side uh, you can see there's a very light yellow line that that's our uh, plan velocity. That's what we hope to achieve every single sprint. And now it's very, uh, very predictable. It's, we're pretty close. We often exceed it. And uh, sometimes we don't quite get there, but we're not off by far every single sprint. And what the gray is, is just uh, points in for bug fixes. So that's gone down as well. Ravi, anything to add on that? All right, thanks. So gentlemen, I want to be conscious of our um, time box here. We've got about two minutes left. If we can maybe, uh, yeah. Sure. yeah right. Adrian, yeah, if you don't mind, I'll, uh, I'll get Go this, uh, I'll wrap it up. So the most important thing is we stand on the shoulder of giants without support from surrounding communities. No matter how awesome your team is, it won't work. Uh, and our recommendation is get C-level support uh, if the sea levels provide safety to learn, the team will get better. Uh, always keep getting better through retros. Hire those hungry team members. Explain why we should do something from a stakeholder perspective. Focus on the culture and the practices will emerge. Right. So in the slides, we'll give you a bunch of references. Um, probably time for maybe one or two questions or, or uh, Eric, if you want, uh, Maybe there's no time for questions, but you can send us questions offline and uh, we will answer them offline. Uh, Eric, closing thoughts about where people can go next to engage with Scrum.org. Exactly. Thanks, Ravi. Yeah, um, what, what we'll do is we'll follow up with questions uh, via email uh, due, due to time. I want to be conscious and, and, and respectful to folks' times. Um, you, you can always learn more, uh, as Ravi has put up here the slide about our learning paths. There's learning paths for each of the roles within Scrum, as well as Agile leaders. Uh, check those out. We, we, we're always learning. People are always learning, and these are always being updated. We're actually in the process of doing some, some major updating to these right now. And keep subscribing to the series. Follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, if you have questions, you can always ask the forum. There's, there's dozens of questions that come in every day. 
and lots of experts who are always out there who are doing this on a daily basis and answering those questions in the forums. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to Adrian and Ravi. Thank you to our audience uh, for taking your time today. I know uh, we're all busy and we're all looking at a lot of screens of late. So it's uh, it's becoming more and more difficult sometimes to, to, to even find an hour to look at yet another screen. So thank you very much and uh, keep continuing to uh, scrum on. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Eric.